Okay, a little introduction. Uh, this episode is long delayed. It was actually originally recorded on the 10th of September, so you should have had it before now. Sorry about that. But I had some technical problems and I've had some health issues. Uh, the main problem was that my side of the conversation didn't really come out, so I've actually had to re-record it, uh, sort of mock up my own side of the conversation. Um, it's it's an honest representation of what I said on the night, and I haven't bothered doing it with all the little interjections, the uh, ahas and mm -hmm's and the little laughs and so on, so you'll hear the quality of the, of the original recording. But uh, I hope you enjoy this one, now that you're finally going to get it. This is I Don't Speak German. <laughs> I'm Jack Graham, he him, and in this podcast I talk to my friend Daniel Harper, also he him, who spent years tracking the far right in their safe spaces. In this show we talk about them, and about the wider reactionary forces feeding them and feeding off them. Be warned, this is difficult subject matter. Content warnings always apply. Okay, and we're back with episode 116 of I Don't Speak German. It's another Daniel-less episode, I'm afraid, but uh, not to worry, he'll be back next time. But we are very lucky that we have, making up the shortfall for this episode, our good friend and excellent former guest, Rob, from The Right Podcast. Welcome back, Rob. How are you doing? Hey, excellent, Jack. Thank you. Great. Well, the um, last episode you were on was very well received, which is uh, good because I, I was very pleased with that. And um, that was a kind of a just uh, shooting the breeze, chucking ideas back and forth, general chat. But this time we're going to talk in a bit more focused way about the Oath Keepers, which you've been doing a lot of research on recently. Yes, yes. And of course, this is pertinent to everybody uh, with the January 6th uh, hearings having closed and court dates uh, being cemented by judges. So in September, we should see some some things happening in the news related to the Oath Keepers. Yeah, and the Oath Keepers have been in the news a lot recently, what with the trial of Stuart Rhodes and a recent leak showing that they have lots of members in the police, the armed forces, and even in government. Yes, yes, that that's true. And without jumping too far ahead, there, there has been a series of efforts from, from the legal team of various members of the Oath Keepers to push back these dates or have things relocated. And those have, have ultimately run their course. So you're correct. Everything is going to proceed. And um, I can tell you that looking at the case, and, and we'll get to that later, uh, the information is is pretty damning. They have uh, communications going back and forth between Rhodes and other leaders within the Oath Keepers, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll read it and, and and see exactly what they're talking about. Okay, well, we'll get to these things, but um, yeah, I, I first became aware of the Oath Keepers, I think, around about the time of the Ferguson protests, when they showed up on the streets of Ferguson, uh, claiming, at least some of them, some of the time, to be there to protect the protesters, which uh, claim pretty soon uh, uh, became uh, obviously not true. Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about their origins, and I think you want to talk uh, specifically about some of their deeper origins in uh, the Tea Party movement. Ferguson is interesting, and and I you know we will get to that. Um, there's I, I think going back and 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 revisiting some some of this territory is important because uh, first of all, a lot of narratives from the right are going to try and um, you know break all this apart, make it confusing, and and I think kind of make these guys. Uh, look like fools, you know, LARPing boomers and, you know, as I said, or something like on the QAnon mind melt level, but they're not. And and even if they themselves are kind of a clown show, it's important to understand that they come from a uh, line of ideologies that, that is coherent, that traces back decades. And um, the fact that they almost achieved something <laughs> is, is frightening. But, uh, you know, Ferguson... And, and other things we'll see along the way offer you foreshadowing. And, and that, that type of hindsight, I think, is important to this analysis because at least I saw patterns that maybe didn't predict what was going to come, but there's certainly correlation at least, if not 
maybe causation to things that did occur later, maybe say with Kyle Rittenhouse, for instance, right? Um, and George Floyd yeah. protest. So yes, I think going back to the beginning, we'll, we'll just start there. Um, so first, I think who are, you know, maybe what are the Oath Keepers? This is high school English class and we have to write out a physician paper. So uh, <laughs> according to uh, Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation, they describe them like this. It's one of the largest and most prominent organizations of the militia and patriot movements with chapters across the United States. And I liked that definition. I looked at many because it included the militia and patriot movements. And those are both things that have existed, of course, and you know, on the right for decades, going back to the 80s and, and prior, but really proliferating in the 1990s. And, and you know, I, I, I like seeing those connections. So that's a good definition, right? One of the most prominent of these. And today, there's roughly, uh, according to the Stanford Center again, 88 chapters nationwide. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens moving forward with Rhodes no longer in charge, as Rhodes was the creator, and he's been the leader since the inception. So, you know, we'll see what happens with this organization. Currently, their website is down and a lot of references to the group have been scrubbed. You know, I've, I've looked at some, I've used some different tools to, in research, trying to look back at maybe references on different platforms and, and a lot of that stuff is, is gone. So yeah, it'll, it, it, it'll be interesting and telling to see what, what happens next with the group at least. Yeah, that does sound like a pretty pretty good description, uh, bringing both the word patriot and the word militia in, because they the Oath Keepers seem to me like a fusion of two pretty distinct trends within the far right, the uh, the militia movement and the, for want of a better term, patriot movement, which to a huge extent now is Trumpism. Exactly, exactly. And I'm going to say we'll get to it, because I, I do feel like there's, there's almost like a case to build um, that that explains what you just said, but but also ties to some historical concepts that that cross over to things that you know you and Daniel might discuss more often. You know, neo-Nazi white nationalist type groups, uh, specifically in in the 1990s, but also militia movement, patriot movement, people like you know Timothy McVeigh, Eric Rudolph, etc. So you know, with with this group. It's it's interesting because again, when when you're talking about the Oath Keepers, at least up until now, there, there's the organization, of course, but you're really talking about the individual, right? The the individual Elmer Stort Rhodes, because he's the person that came up with it. He's the one that organized it, and and he was the one that launched it. And he did launch it in 2009. And the 2009 was was an an interesting point in in history. Barack Obama had just been elected president. Um, yeah. This is when, yes, and the, and the Tea Party was 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 getting going, and it, it's a you know about a, a it's a decade roughly past some some of those domestic terrorist uh, events in the United States uh, from figures that we just we just discussed like McVeigh and and Eric Rudolph etc. So it, it's you know they they sometimes I think that you know these organizations luck into things and. And this was a, a flashpoint, I think, uh, and an opportunity for something like this to occur. And they formed in uh, Lexington Common, Massachusetts. And for you know history buffs, that when you hear anything about that area, I was just in that area of the country actually. It's uh, you know it, for the United States, probably the American Revolutionary War, War of Independence, and that's why they were there. So you know, it, it, invoking. The, this uh, revolutionary kind of uh, Tea Party um, aesthetic into the very inception of, of the group. And I was digging around. I saw some articles from the era, one from the Boston Globe that described it as an event in Lexington, Lexington that sought symbolically to liken their aims to those of the Revolutionary War. And, you know, when I talk about, in hindsight, you know, 2020 and foreshadowing, um, I mean, this is ultimately where Rhodes and a you know small group of of figures from this group were were headed. Right at, at the end, they they were attempting an insurrection, essentially, and in their eyes, a revolutionary war. So, from the very beginning to the very end, at least of their tenure, um, you know that that was a theme that that ran throughout. And again, it's 
I do feel like this group in particular, but some other groups, uh, I, I feel like sometimes they, they are looked at as, again, being harmless, being bumbling, you know, um, or silly. And, and that was even present in some of the, uh, the platform chats that I saw on, on various platforms, whether it was like 4chan or, or parlor, et cetera, you know, that, that they were kind of made fun of, but, but even still, you know, in their, you know, clown show, um, this was the intent all along and it was kind of out there for everybody to see. Right. And we just chose not to, to take it seriously, I suppose. But in that, in that opening speech, right. Invoking a revolutionary war, um, the themes from the speakers included a looming second revolutionary war. They talked about things like globalism um, and globalism's threat to American sovereignty, um, the need to resist a tyrannical federal government. So, I mean, just from the very beginning, what Rhodes was saying and people were speaking at the very inception of this group, you know, are these core right-wing conspiratorial tropes that can look forward into the future about kind of where we ended up at January 6th, but also, you know, into the past and, and some of these ideologies that existed prior to say 2009, roughly. Um, and again, I, I think it's important because, you know, another thing too, is that for some reason, uh, at least in the United States, right wing figures tend to be, you know, pinned down as being lone, a lone wolf. And, which is interesting when you have a, a, a pack of them and then they're lone wolves, plural somehow. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> these, these people were more or less consistent um, ideologically, you know, dating back, as you mentioned, to, I mean, as far back as you want to go, but at least the, the 70s in the U.S. for sure. Um, so, you know, that was one of the, the, the eye-opening things that I saw when I was doing this research. I just... Um, I was the, the Charlie Day person with the yarn on the wall saying, oh, my gosh. I mean, they, they were telling you what they were wanting to do, and we let them do it. Yeah. yeah. But I think along with this, like concurrently to this, is, you know, Stuart Rhodes and, and who he is just as, as an American and, and his kind of generation. You know, th thinking back of like, okay, so what is the president to this? Uh, in modern U.S. history, you, you had Re the Reagan years of, of the satanic panic, a, a new Red Scare in which he and Thatcher both turned anti-communist rhetoric inward towards labor and the Democratic parties. And while that's a bit out of scope, it's important because, you know, that is what informed the patriot movements and the militia movements of the 1990s, of which... Apparently, if, if we you know go to the definition given prior, the Oath Keepers are uh, something of the inheritors of, or at least the largest of these two movements. So there's a lot of of precedents in, in, in involved in this when we're talking about right wing movements. It, it wasn't something that just popped up out of nowhere, I suppose, in, in 2009. And you know, the decade prior, or you know, a little bit less. All of these things were, because a lot of that was based around the millennium, but were compounded by September 11th and the introduction of Islamophobia, as well as an introduction to endless war, which created endless veterans, essentially, and a lot of people who became radicalized. So the Oath Keepers uh, you know, had this context and uh, a population of people to disseminate this information to and, and to garner support from. Um, again, I just think it's important to understand that these conspiracies and beliefs were not isolated and they weren't just roses. They, they weren't created in a vacuum that they're very much a part of the history, the modern history of right wing radicalism in the United States. And the Oath Keepers are just a modern incarnation of that, I suppose. Looking at the group, again, focusing on roads, there's even some mystery around him you know he has the eye patch he's he's a veteran as well um looking at the reality of of where he came from so he was born in 1966 which puts him in that generation kind of described before he did join the military but he was discharged after a parachuting accident um military.com surprisingly had an article um that went through his retirement paperwork describing him as essentially a normal soldier nothing really stood out there's no great distinction 
Um, the, the patch over his eye has nothing to do with his military service. That was an injury that occurred in, uh, when he dropped a loaded handgun that shot him in the face by accident. So that was, uh, not due to his, his military service, which ended also in a parachuting accident too. Um, not to besmirch his service, but he did play off of that a lot when he was trying to recruit people. And, um, it was a little eye opening to see an outlet like military.com uh you know describing his service in 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 some black and white details that that weren't all that great i suppose um he did go to college and he's an intelligent fellow he 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 went to college in nevada um in between his undergraduate and graduate work he worked on the ron paul campaign but he attended graduate school at at yale university yes we'll get to the ron paul (laughs) Yeah, that's another thread I've encountered in my researches many times. Uh, the Ron Paul revolution. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. It's it's same thing here, right? It's it's those red flags popping up. Um, but yeah, he did. I, I he did attend Yale University. I was just outside of Yale a few days ago, and um, he was able to graduate. So, you know, he, he's a smart fellow at least. But mm-hmm. yeah, the the Ron Paul. Let's let's talk about that because. Um, even though, you know, the Ron Paul thing might not have anything to do specifically with Oath Keepers, it, it definitely gives you some insight into who Rhodes is. So now, now when you snickered, I, I'm guessing, and, and you can, you know, add on or, or, or go in another direction. When I think of Ron Paul, I think of the newsletters and, and some of yeah. the comments. Yeah, yeah, that were coming up. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I guess, not, not to give a history of Ron Paul, but so people who, who aren't aware of this you know, ron paul ran as, as this kind of libertarian candidate and um he was trying to to make a pitch i think as being you know like almost like a like a third party alternative person um with, with a whole bunch of, of just a grab bag of, of concepts and ideas um and, and that worked for a while until some old newsletters were leaked and they were just filled to the brim with conspiracies and, and racism essentially and i, I think the biggest one uh, was discussion around the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, there w- in which he said essentially that that was you know paraphrasing that that the federal government had had overstepped that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 should not have occurred um, that you can't coerce people or you know a, a, a line I think often used is legislate morality and that all these bad things that that you know everything from from redlining to job discrimination to, well they, they would eventually go away usually really relying on the free market in in one way or another people wouldn't want to go to you know a business that that wouldn't hire black men say so you know that was i think roughly kind of the idea behind the civil rights act deeply rooted in in a libertarian concept of the role of the federal government um there were other comments too though uh, within these these newsletters that were even more overt, you know, alluding to, for instance, the crime rates of of black men specifically. So um, it, it was not good. Uh, you know, coupled with the, this racism, there was also uh, anti-Semitic memes that were being shared by Paul's Twitter account, and, and that creates some waves as well. One specifically I'm thinking of, it looks like someone just picked it right up off of 8chan or 4chan of uh, a Jewish per- person with the, the stereotypical, you know, hooked nose, um, a person of African-American descent punching Uncle Sam. Yes, I remember that. That was the one with a big red fist that was created by uh, an assemblage of racist stereotypes. Exactly. And 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 to just compound how horrible it was, um, the the lettering around it, the text was, you know, cultural Marxism. And I'm sure, you know, you're well aware of, of what that means, especially in, in German history and, and how that was used. You know, th- so so these were things that, that were just being, you know, discovered or openly shared and promoted by this campaign. Um, coincidentally, um, thinking about some of the, say like that, that arguments about the Civil Rights Act, you know, that that's the same. It, it's It's very similar to things that you know, for instance, Eric Rudolph talked about in his autobiography. And uh, for folks, I've said that name a few times. If you're not aware, he was a terrorist in the United States. He bombed the uh, Atlanta Olympic Games. He bombed abortion clinics and he bombed a gay nightclub as well. So 
it, it, you know, I'm making these connections saying, okay, you know, th- this is, this is where these people come from. This is that ideological, you know, connection. And, and Rudolph talked about specifically about his childhood experiences in, in school, this idea of cultural Marxism taking over. Um, in an interview, and, and this was a great article, I think, if anyone's interested in Oath Keepers, you should look at this. It was by the Southern Poverty Law Center, and they interviewed, uh, essentially, Rhodes' family. And one of his daughters, I'm, I'm going to kind of reference this kind of within context of other events throughout, but um, one of his daughters named Sequoia said that um, Rhodes, at one point, surrounded himself by people in the liberty movement, and the liberty movement was tied to this Ron Paul campaign, essentially. Um, and that within the liberty movement, people were legitimately afraid of what Barack Obama was going to do if, if he was elected. And without giving a history of that time era, I think, you know, Barack Obama was pinned as everything from the, the Antichrist to the Manchurian candidate, cultural Marxists, <laughs> et cetera. Oh, it's just yeah. the, the grab bag, right? But I mean, I think it's interesting because this would be a pivotal point in Rhodes's life, having just graduated college and moving into his graduate studies. Um, and it also just ties back again to this, this lineage of, of conspiracies. And I think ultimately, because you know, I might forget to mention this later, we were kind of talking back and forth earlier in text, at least. And it, it may be aside and not really for this, but perhaps in the future. There's an interesting, uh, you know, editorial, I, I, I think, uh, potential story out there of looking at, at who the Oath Keepers are in Rhodes as looking at someone, a man that just kind of falls apart and how these conspiracy theories and, and how radicalization just destroyed his life and his family's life and, and people around him that believed in him and supported him too. Um, I think that maybe that's a subplot in all of this, the role of right-wing conspiracies and, and just what they do to people. Um, mm. And of course, you know, that's been a topic lately with QAnon and COVID and et cetera. But. Yeah, that's been a recurring theme on I Don't Speak German as well, the way these people really do sabotage their own lives. But uh, please go on. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, I'll talk a little bit more about conspiracies, but then we'll get into further. But the conspiracies are, you know, what led other people in this time period to, to commit acts of violence too. You brought that up. I, I, I put a pin in Jim Atkinson. That's somebody who I discussed earlier, but that's another great example. If, if folks want to go look at that. Um, and he's of this time era. He specifically calls out these exact conspiracies about Barack Obama in his manifesto. Um, also, I think too, talking about foreshadowing as well, if we're talking about this era one of the conspiracies was essentially the the political slogan or platform that launched Donald Trump's political career. And that was the birther movement, of course. And, you yeah. know, Donald Trump, had, yeah, you know, people f- sometimes forget he ran for president prior to 2016. And he, you know, his platform was of this, this conspiracy of, of birther, you know, conspiracy. So it's just, just all of that. Again, just just you know, red flags and and things along the way that that end up manifesting later. Um, something maybe that's more related to the Oath Keepers, you know, as opposed to the general zeitgeist of, of that era, um, is the uh, the Oath Keepers. I guess you know, you know pledge, or, or I suppose that, that we could talk about. But even before that, going way back to two thousand and eight. Before the Oath Keepers existed, um, Rhodes had written an article for SWAT magazine, and it was entitled Enemy at the Gates. And, and I think that this is good because it directly informs what that, that pledge is going to say. And, and that pledge, I think, is going to, there's going to be a lot of buzzwords you know, in it. But in this article back in 2008, he, he, he talked about this fictitious world in which Hillary Clinton was elected president. He, he referred to her as her Hitlery. Um, there was a national emergency declared by Hillary Clinton um, that was used as an excuse to seize firearms. American patriots, as described by him, were placed in military detention. And um, there's a leverage of powers by the federal government to allow Hillary Clinton to become a dictator. And, you know, it's just so loaded. 
<laughs> when we talk about right wing conspiracies. Um, but it, again, I think it gives you insight into the thinking of, of the leader of this, you know, organization and and what he thought. I kind of had two takeaways from from that. You know, first one of irony because later Rhodes would publicly, you know, declare on things like Infowars that Donald Trump should impose the Insurrection Act uh, post George Floyd protests and to to crush his political opponents, which is essentially you know the opposite of what he just or fulfilling, I should say, what he described here as as a nightmare. But I also thought of the Turner Diaries and. You know, to me, thinking of the show, yeah, the you know federal government takes away your guns under the, under the Cohen Act. Of course, it has to be you know a Jewish name. There's oppressive policies in the name of anti-racism. Patriots are detained. It ends in revolution. And just swapping out some things, you know, maybe instead of overt racism, saying anti-racists who are actually fascists. You know, it's but th- these things rang bells to me like the Turner Diaries going way back. Because, again, I, I think it's important to see that th- it's not a new phenomenon. It's not lone wolves. It's not just ideas of one crazy, you know, silly old man. That that these are things that are embedded in in right-wing extremist culture, at least in the United States, and, and they have a, a history to them. You know, all, these things will come up again in, in other forms as well. So... Thinking about the Turner Diaries, maybe specifically, and, and some other things that cross over into more white supremacist, you know, areas or neo-Nazi areas, we come to the Oath Keepers orders, and there's ten of them. I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to read them all. I was considering it, but that's th- there are some highlights though, and I think that looking at these highlights, you know, you'll see uh, that yes, <laughs> we, we we've heard these before, and I don't speak German. Um, so the first one, we will not obey orders to disarm the American people, um, that we won't detain American citizens, um, as unlawful enemy combatants or subject them to a military tribunal, um, that there will be no martial law or state of emergency used for, uh, uh, usurpation of power, um, that there, the idea of, uh, an invading, uh, military or foreign soldiers to subjugate any state that asserts its sovereignty and you know that's civil war essentially blockading american citizen uh, cities turning them into what he calls giant concentration camps again foreign soldiers on u.s soil to me listening to these things concentration camps foreign soldiers on u.s soil subject uh invade and subjugate states asserting sovereignty yeah you know (laughs) whatever crazy right-wing trope conspiracy going as far back as the the 60s wherever you want to go with it you know these are all things that you could pick apart or you could use the turner diaries for an example too you know all of these have those flavors in it and it's almost like when you read through this and this was on their their website formerly it it almost seems as if they aggregated them (laughs) in a way into this (laughs) this this Right. It, it's, you know, it's almost like a hipster type thing where you just took all the good stuff from the prior generations and, and recreate something new. Um, but it, it, it does seem as if, you know, they, they were at least paying homage to these past, you know, militias and and radical right wing extremists, at least in, in the United States, for sure. Moving forward with that. Um, and this is you had discussed this you know, earlier, their uh, recruitment was advertised as being geared towards the military, um, veterans, law enforcement, um, but they would take anybody. And, you know, it does appear as if most, most members weren't necessarily in those categories. However, <laughs> there, there, wa- there have been leaks. And, you know, there is one that was put out by Distributed Denial of Secrets. It's a nonprofit journalist collective. An elite, more than 38,000 names associated with Oath Keepers. Uh, the ADL, um, Anti-Defamation Anti-Def- uh, League, has analyzed it. And, and I believe that this is an ongoing process because of the, the number of, of people here. But uh, so far, they found 81 elected officials just from that league, 373 law enforcement, 159 active duty military res- reserves and civilian contractors on the list. Since then, there have been more as well. 
But looking at that, there was one example, because when you throw numbers out there, it can be abstract, right? So an example from that league pointed to an Anaheim Police Department sergeant whose name was Michael Lynch. And he wrote that he has, in quotes, a wide variety of law enforcement experience, including undercover operations, surveillance and SWAT. Um, He's saying, I'm also a member of the executive board for my police labor association. (laughs) And so something, right, (laughs) right. Uh, Yeah. So, you know, looking at some of these the insight and, and and the ADL has all this posted on their site. Um, they have many quotes. There, there's another one um, from a military member, but you begin to see, cause it's easy to diminish math can do spectacular things. But when you look at who these individuals are, I think it does bring to light how significant it is. Um, there was another uh, who is self-identified as a member of the army. And he said, and these are his quotes, First and foremost, I believe the oath I took when I enlisted in the Army should always be held as a high standard. The Constitution supersedes all law enforcement and even the president's. I can shoot a weapon and I hit my target. I can help when the federal government tries to enact martial law upon its citizens. And so, you know, these are the members or these are people that, that were involved in it. And, you know, these were the people that were, you know, in one way or another involved in events that occurred on on January 6th that that we'll get to. Looking at some of the things that that his children said kind of related to this, in describing Rhodes, his daughter Sequoia stated that what Rhodes really wanted was collapse. You know, he wanted to be the king after this collapse. And he had his own little army. So it was, you know, always going to be that way, according to, to her. Sedona, another of his daughters, said that he was always obsessing about societal collapse and the American Revolution. She says you could tell that he wanted to be the next George Washington. So, you know, there's a lot going on with with that. I mean, that gets into the realm of, you know, psychology and and cult think, I think, too. But it, it, it does at least, I think, provide insight into how serious you know, these people were and, and kind of what, how, how they saw themselves and what it is that, that they were trying to achieve. Yeah. And it's a version of a thing that's very old on the right. I mean, we see it today in the Boogaloo Boys with their accelerationism and their second civil war stuff. And it goes back to, well, it goes back much further than, but you know, it reminds me of um, Charles Manson and his idea of helter skelter, the coming race war after which he would emerge as the, the new leader of the surviving white people. That's, you know, I, I didn't, I forgot about Manson. You're, you're right. Exactly. And, you know, you can take, take away from, from that statement, whatever you will. But I, I do think it's a, I, I, important for folks to understand this is just maybe hopefully a small piece, but it's a, it is a piece of just American culture. You know, it's been something that's generational and, and the Oath Keepers were a manifestation of that, you know, and, and there will be more. So, but uh, understanding that I think helps anybody to understand who Rhodes was or is and, and what the Oath Keepers really were, especially again with the, what I'm suspecting will be a deluge of information coming out, talking about how they were lone wolves or, you know, LARPing boomers or, you know, buffoons, et cetera. No, they weren't, right? They, they were just one iteration of something that's existed for decades. But Going back to that recruiting, you know, something else that's important too. Um, it, I mean, it's 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 eerie enough looking at the positions of some of these. I mean, someone being in a police union, you know, figures enough. But there there were also early efforts that focused on Tea Party rallies, and and that goes back to two thousand and nine, the two thousand and and ten era. And you know, with with the the Tea Party, people might not you know even know. What, what the Tea Party was at this point. But I mean, I, I think it was a political manifestation of, of concepts that were previously held by the fringes of the right wing during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And that sometimes those figures were apolitical, at least if we're talking about like electoralism. To, to me, I, I, I went straight to, to Eric Rudolph and, you know, he wrote, that he lamented the GOP was not representing patriots like himself and that they were, in his words, allowing radical leftist socialists to take control without any serious pushback so that he was 
forced, and this is how someone like he justifies it, he was forced to take matters into his own hands by committing acts of terrorism because he had no political representation within the Republican Party. Well, I think the Tea Party is is what began to pave the way for the legitimization of ideas and concepts held by people like Eric Rudolph that, of course, manifested later with MAGA and the election of, of Donald Trump. Um, but kind of before we get all of that, I, Rhodes shared a, a lot of beliefs himself that he carried over to the Oath Keepers with some of these older militia movement, patriot movement you know, figures. And looking back again at his the interviews with his children, his children just described what it was like growing up in this environment with, with Oath Keepers and, and prior. And in the interview, they said it, it didn't impinge on our lives. It deformed our lives. Our lives happened in the breathing space left around Oath Keepers. There was no independence from it whatsoever. According to him, it was our brief moments of existence before the world ended. Uh, Sequoia, again, uh, one of his daughters stated that for my childhood and, and early middle school years, I did not think I had a future. He told us that the world is going to end. And, you know, that brought a lot of connections. Of course, we have QAnon today and, and MAGA. And, you know, it's kind of this cult thing, you know, that we, that we mentioned earlier. But another name that I thought of with this too, that laid some precedent and and was in a roundabout way a, a key figure to radicalization of the, of the militia movement was Randy Weaver in the United States, of course. The standoff you know, with uh, at Ruby Ridge and and w- without you know less so the historical events of that, but what he actually believed, and of course he he held an anti-government apocalyptic belief system. And when you look and you research he and his family. I mean, you know, his wife was doing things like sending these apocalyptic letters to government officials, you know, talking about the world is going to end and revelations is going to occur and stuff unless things drastically changed. But there was, I I think, a a key thing involved with that being the Christian identity movement, which is essentially an anti-Semitic sect of Christianity that claims that that whites of Europe descended uh, from the lost tribes of Israel and that Jewish people are basically sa- the satanic offspring of, of Eve and the serpents going back to the garden of, of Eden. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, kind of where I'm going with it to, to, to pull this all together, you know, we're talking, what, what's the thing that, that, that ties this bow? Well, in the nineties, it was the new world order and in, in the aughts, it became um, globalists. Right. And you can talk and, and, and then QAnon, et cetera. But, you know, th- this this is a, a a key thing that that runs through and straight this idea of apocalyptic, you know, far right Christianity, but also this this cabal of people operating in dark rooms, and of course, who when you get down to it, who is always leading this cabal of people, right? It's yeah. it's always Jewish, yeah, it's always Jewish yeah. people. So again. For the purpose, I, I, I do think there's utility in, in, in having these discussions and, and understanding this to understand the Oath Keepers, right? You know, if people are talking like, like Stuart Rhodes about New World Order and globalists, you know, this is what they're talking about. And it's not something that Alex Jones came up with, you know. This is something that's existed for a long time, right? So, you know, th- this is what informed the, the Oath Keepers. Um, Rhodes's daughter, Dakota, another daughter, described also kind of frequenting gun shows as well when they were children. And um, it was a way for the family, she said, to socially network. And, you know, this, of course, in my mind, brings me right to Timothy McVeigh, because this is what he said on his trial. Um, and it's what he discussed uh, as, as a, a key thing, a, a, you know, kind of early ages of the Internet. Maybe going back far enough, you know, pre-internet with with zines and things, but the idea that gun shows were a, a way for this kind of all these conspiracy theories, all these militia people to kind of get together and and congregate and socially network. And his daughter talked about that. She talked about meeting people from Bo Greit's Spike program, and 
you know, Bo Kreitz was involved in the Ruby Ridge standoff. He was someone that helped talk Randy Weaver down, actually. And he was also involved in some fabulous things like the Christian Patriot Movement. Um, and he was a former candidate for the Populist Party, the one that David Duke also ran on. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the connections are so close with, with he being um, Rhodes, you know, exposing his family to th- th- this is what these children grew up with, essentially. And it's the remnants of that 1990s Patriot Movement. Um, there was one thing that I pulled out from, from Greitz I thought was, again, I, I, telling. So at these gun shows, right, Greitz would show up. And now I have quotes here about this thing, but he would, it, it's almost like a performative act that he would do. So he would say, I don't see a single person sitting here that won't get a chance in their lifetime to say no to this new world order, this antichrist. And then he would burn a uh, United Nations flag while citing Revelations 1411, um, which says, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. That was, I, I, I grabbed that from a article from the Kansas Reflector that was talking about Timothy McVeigh. It was like a retrospective of Timothy McVeigh. So the new world order, right? this idea of the globalists and looking at all these things that we talked about when, when they're, when the right wing is talking about these, these international cabals and globalist globalization, you know, who are they always talking about? Right? And, and so this is, this is, Again, the soup of which the Oath Keepers kind of came out of, right? Mm-hmm. So moving on with that, I said, you know, and perhaps I'm making, I, I did question myself at a moment, am I making narratives that don't exist? But I, I, I did find an article from the Southern Poverty Law Center that stated Oath Keepers uh, circulated similar conspiracies um, regarding globalists um, and uh, of I, I have here if, if Daniel was on, but of course, you know, things that you and Daniel would, would understand, such as secret cabals of, of globalists, um, international organizations, the United Nations attempting to, you know, usurp sovereignty of, of the American government and enslave patriots. And I'm sure that that all sounds very familiar. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think lastly, to kind of maybe wrap this up is uh, to... For the, I don't speak German audience, maybe specifically, I think if you go far enough back, you know, to me, you get to the protocols of the elders of Zion, right? The secret plans of Jewish goal to rule and manipulate the economy, controlling the media, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's important to emphasize these beliefs to to build that bridge, right? From right-wing extremists in the U.S. dating back decades and and pre-United States to what the Oath Keepers were doing, Um, again, as a way to combat what I can only foresee coming is trying to paint these guys as, as anything but dangerous. So, you know, with, with that, then we kind of get into the organization because now we know <laughs> where, did, what informed this organization, what's the ideology. And, you know, it, it isn't as if this group was putting out, you know, deep ideological posts. So you, you kind of have to do that digging to get down and see where did roads come from and, and, and where these ideas come from. But I think, again, in, in, in hindsight, it was, it was pretty clear this was not going to be just, you know, a group of people marching with, I don't know, you know, tri-corner revolutionary hats on, you know, talking about taxes. And it, it goes back, it, when we talk about courts, you know, and, and, and to, so one year after the group was founded, it, it, it only took one year. One of their members, Matthew Fairfield, was arrested for explosive charges, including storage of live napalm in his basements, which is fabulous. And he lived in the in like a residential area that that he had a live napalm bomb in his uh, in his possession. Same, yeah, not a great neighbor. Same year, Darren Huff attempted to take control of the Madisonville, Tennessee courthouse um, under the use of uh, citizens' arrest. He was armed with a pistol and a rifle. Um, perhaps some foreshadowing there, because we're going to see groups, including the Oath Keepers, occupy uh, territories in, 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 the, in the future with the group. But um, another great one, uh, Charles Dreyer, very early on, he appeared in videos uh, talking about the impending New World Order. Uh, he was charged with uh, possession of a stolen live grenade launcher and the rape of his daughter, who was a minor at the time. So, you know, th- these are the just the very 
first few years of, of the organization. And of course, there are other lesser things, misdemeanors, but you know, these are the ones that, that jumped out. Again, in hindsight, you know, they're, they're telling you the types of people who are involved in this, and they're telling you what they believe, and you know, none of it's good, right? But yeah. this was, when I saw this, again, it, was, it had the same impact as looking at the comments of Rhodes' family and all these connections. I'm, I was like, oh, I've heard this before. This is what Tim McVeigh said. This is what Eric Rudolph said. One of their first actions, kind of outside of just trying to, to organize, um, occurred in uh, Quartzsite, Arizona. And the event itself wasn't, there wasn't really, it wasn't a big thing per se. It was, it was protests over a blogger named Jay Jones, and she was arrested for disorderly conduct in a town hall. But this was of that, that era um, in, in which you know, the Tea Party was, was kind of in full swing and use of social media was was being leveraged. So there was a video of this woman who was speaking at a town hall and essentially she wanted to put the mic down when people told her to. So she was kind of derailing the whole thing. It, you know, to me, it, it reminded me of the critical race theory town hall, you know, videos that were proliferating, I don't know, a year and a half ago, I guess now. Yeah, where, you yeah. know, they, they're just getting derailed by by these folks, but also COVID things too. But, you know, more significant than this blogger and, and maybe some foresight about that um, was um, just Burgess. And I believe that's how you pronounce the name. But it, it was a Tea Party supporter and an Arizona state representative who was involved with all of this. And a, a quote that, that I got from them was, you know, they have to call us domestic terrorists because we are the group that's going to stand up to their communist agenda. So, you know, connecting the dots of of this early Oath Keeper interaction with Tea Party, you know, members who are also government officials who legitimized extreme ideas from the 80s and 90s. I, I think it's, 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 you can, you can see the, the road that's being paved to, to MAGA and, and events that occurred later. But something else that stood out too was in, in all of this kind of small town, you know, controversy was their mayor. So courtside mayor Ed Foster. And um, in all of this, he he claimed that because he came out in support of this blogger that he was getting railroaded essentially, essentially. And he made claims that he lost his recall election due to voter fraud. Um, and he was the individual who reached out to the Oath Keepers to, to ask them to, to come in and, and join these protests. And this was in 2011. So, you know, to me, obvi- I mean, I think it's it's fairly clear the the comparisons to what happened with with Donald Trump and, and the Oath Keepers later. But yeah, it's an incredible foreshadowing, isn't it? Yeah, the, just the foreshadowing was was amazing. Another thing, so crossover with the Tea Party in 2012. These are just some things, some some notes because there's much more. But the actual Tea Party invited local law enforcement to an Oath Keepers form. Um, there's the widely spread image of Ted Cruz, of course, campaigning in front of the Oath Keepers flag. The Tea Party, uh, the, the Tea Party Nation, posted pro Oath Keeper content on our website in in the same era. So there was just a lot of co-mingling. You know, this is, I think, if you're looking at like a retrospective, th- this is when the Oath Keepers gained some legitimization, as opposed to just being, you know, some just you know, weird sect that, that shows up in, in costumes at, at protests. This is when they're making inroads with, with political movements and, and people in political office, which is important. You know, these, these are the pre-MAGA um, um, representatives, I guess you could say. Uh, Ted Cruz, of course, would be in the, but yeah. But something else before we get to, to Ferguson, because really, as, as you said, it, if Ferguson and the Clive Bundy protests over the, the Bureau of, of Landman. Th- th- those two those two events are what really launched the group into, I think, you know, a, a national stage in, in which people began to know who they are, as opposed to, you know, a, a few sheriffs, say, in, in, in a county being invited to, to a speech or something. But there, there, there was one other, you know, foreshadowing to there, there in the same era, so 2012, 13, or around there, there was an Oath Keeper supporter Army Major General Albert Stubblebine, 
And he was spreading misinformation regarding the government's reaction to H1N1 or swine flu. And then he was doing this under, you know, the, the Oath Keepers brand, I suppose you could say. Um, but in talking about then President Obama's actions regarding swine flu, in quotes, he said, perhaps the most ominous domestic events I have ever encountered. We either take this hill or we die on it. He went on to state that Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia declared war on their own people. Has the United States declared war on the American people today? Sadly, tragically, it would appear so. I do not wish to see the American population corralled, controlled, and killed. H1N1 or swine flu has never been a serious illness. And my gosh, if that is just not every anti-lockdown, you know, just just yeah. reiterated or right over COVID. Yeah, again, an almost exact foreshadowing of what was to come. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And um and there's more, unfortunately, <laughs> but <laughs> isn't there always? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, my interpretation of what this group was before really doing the work on it, um, I envisioned it kind of as stated earlier, you know, LARPing older people, maybe they were veterans, maybe they weren't. They want to pretend like they're in the military if they weren't. So that kind of got themselves wrapped up into something bigger than what they really were. And that was wrong. You know, it, it was inaccurate. N- not only was there a lot of history, you know, in the in the extremist ideologies that these people pose, but there, as we're seeing, there's a lot of foreshadowing too. And, you know, you can only wonder, and you know, it's not for me to do this now, but I... It, it, it is something to wonder about what, you know, how will this re-manifest, you know, if this organization collapses because everybody is behind bars or, or because the, the group changes its, 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 you know, image so that it can continue to exist. What, what's the next thing to come, right? But different discussion, I guess. The big moments, again, were Ferguson. And, and you know, this is where we kind of started. And, and I think it's excellent that you started with this because I think for most people, um, this is when the Oath Keepers hit the scene. You know, this is when people began to understand who they were. And, well, Ferguson had a, had a whole lot going on with it. But in short, there there were protests surrounding Michael Brown, an unarmed black 18-year-old who was shot dead by a white police officer in, in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, it, it's also kind of when Black Lives Matter began to to hit the scene, too. So the protests, though... You know, looking back at Ferguson, and and there's a lot of personal things with this too. I was I was in, involved in in education um, in an urban area at this time, so I, you know, I I recall a lot of these events. But they were for the most part peaceful. You know, there was vandalism at night and and the things that you would normally see. But in in general, on on the big picture, it, they were generally peaceful, at least in in the daytime, yeah. and. I had here about foreshadowing. Unfortunately, there's a lot of comparisons to draw about what happened, you know, in to Michael Brown in this this event. But you know, it's it's worth at least bringing up that you know this is going to happen again and again and again. But as mentioned earlier, you know, I think George Floyd protests would would be the the big one that that we would look at. And asking, you know, what did the Oath Keepers accomplish? It's it's really hard to say, you know. Um, I, I I looked at what they were doing at at the time, and they were in Ferguson twice. But um, there there was a Newsweek article from the era that 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 interviewed some people who were in the Oath Keepers, and they claimed that one of their goals was to arm black protesters. Um, now I don't know if this was an initiative that was supported by. The, the organization, because there's going to be some contradictory information about that later. But in this one statement, too, you know, it, it, it's insightful because there, there, you can see the disconnect. You know, um, one Oath Keeper in this article said that um, African Americans in Ferguson told him that they didn't, that they felt if they carried the same weapons as he was carrying, that police would kill him. And, and he didn't understand this. You know, he said that this is your right. The St. Louis County Police um, eventually um, made their appearance in Ferguson. They stated that they didn't want the Oath Keepers there. Their presence was unnecessary and inflammatory. Say what you will about the police. But I I kind of think that that statement is accurate. Um, Oath Keepers were were doing things like 
having uh, you know, kind of like vigilante patrols in neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. They would be up on rooftops with weapons. Um, local authorities did eventually intervene and, and disband them. Um, Oath Keepers, and I think that this was a thing that kind of stood out to me. They were trying to justify this by saying that they're acting as security, right? That they're acting as security for protesters and acting as security for local businesses, which is pretty much, I think, what Kyle Rittenhouse stated when he was on trial, right? You know, again, say, not not here to stand for police, but I, what the police did say was that their presence was unnecessary and inflammatory. Yes, you know, and, and yeah. foreshadowing, I think, you know, that played out. That's what happens when bad things happen and go sideways, people get killed, you know? <laughs> but I think kind of with, with them, the facts are just that nobody wanted them there necessarily. Nobody wanted them to come. No one asked them to come, at least. They weren't licensed um, to provide security in the States. Some states in the U.S. have things like guard cards. You have to go through training, very basic things. They didn't do that. They were acting as vigilantes, essentially. And they, so they're, they were acting outside of the law, um, foreshadowing, you know. But also, too, just such a grand disconnect with the population living there. And, you know, in situations like that, things are complicated. And sometimes there might be people who, who welcome you know, groups like this initially. I personally re- remembered living in a in a city that was having some issues with crime, and um, guardian angels began patrolling the neighborhood. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, and it was kind of the same flavor, maybe less militarized. But I mean, I can just tell you this: the the last person that you wanted to see talking to you, or wave at you, or or interact with you, were them. <laughs> um <laughs> they they weren't helping put it that way um yeah. but you know just that 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 disconnect of a, a white man dressed up as if he was in the military with some type of you know large long long barreled gun or something saying well you can do this too and people say no we can't you know that that, that just uh, struck me as well you know but um, the following year, and, and this is where things get a little funky. The following year, um, Oath Keepers came back and they acted as security to InfoWars reporters who were going to Ferguson um, during the anniversary of all, all the events, you know, commemorating Michael Brown's death. So there, there is official security for InfoWars um, not serving the community of Ferguson or doing anything in between the, the two events. But this caused conflict within the group. And, and I think that this is insightful too. So again, this would be the year after the actual protest in, in Ferguson. There was a member of the Oath Keepers named Sam, uh, Sam Andrews, and he wanted to organize an open carry march with black residents to kind of really push this, you know? Um, and, you know, who knows what, maybe there were some good motivations involved with that, despite maybe a lack of understanding, but um, roads and, the national board, whatever that's composed of, I don't know, but so there's national board for Oath Keepers, um, squashed the idea and they stated concerns over optics. And it's insightful given all that we talked about previously, you know, the historical, the roots of these ideas and where they come from. And, and now this, this concept of optics and, and the optics would be Oath Keepers arming or, or walking with armed black residents of Ferguson, potentially in protest against law enforcement. Well, you know, this discussion, they never had this discussion when they were at Clyde Bundy's ranch, for instance. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't have this discussion later, we'll see, when, when they're at, you know, a national refuge and, and occupying that with other Bundy relatives. So, yeah, I think it's very clear what the optics are and, and what roads and this national board thought might be an issue. So, you know, that's a good segue because Ferguson was the big one. But, you know, I think equally as, as significant and potentially more because it, it, it did manifest in violence eventually uh, was the Bundy family. So now, you know, this goes back a long time. Uh, th- this was a, a protest that, that was, I think, representative of some 
potentially, uh, you know, legitimate grievances people in, in the Southwest and Western parts of the United States had against the Bureau of Land Management. Long story short, essentially, um, families a long time ago were granted land permits from the government to graze cattle. And the Bundy family specifically had been in conflict with the Bureau of Land Management going back to the 1990s. So there's a whole bunch of of backstory to it. But, you know, really for this, you have to fast forward to 2014, which again is moving. We're moving forward in in chronology here after uh, Ferguson and the court site and and these other things we talked about. And, and, you know, the action really picks up when um, the Bureau of Land Management started taking punitive actions um, against the the Bundy family and and the Bundy Ranch. So essentially, what happened was after a series of, of legal disputes, this family just kept grazing their their cattle in the place where they shouldn't have been doing that. <laughs> I mean, that's it's kind of the the long story short. Um, you know, there, there was an ongoing court case, but they just you know just kept doing what they wanted to do, and eventually. The uh, Bureau of Land Management said, okay, well, we're going to start impounding your livestock, you know, and at this point, it had been going on for like a decade or so. So the, uh, you know, it, it's something to say BML, but that's Black Lives Matter. So the Bureau of Land Management started impounding livestock, and this led to confrontations with the family. Um, Dave Bundy, Clive's son, was arrested for re- refusing to disperse and resisting arrest. Um, Ammon, another one of his sons, was shot with a stun gun. And it was at this point where these these you know the, the the conflict was was escalating that the oath keepers entered the picture, along with with other militias from ar- around the country. But you know, when I was reading this and I saw the the conflict occurring with the family again, I just you know it, it's it's in the zeitgeist I think of, of right wing extremism in, in the modern U.S. I'm gonna straight back to Ruby Ridge as well, you know and. Um, j- just watching the, the escalation, and and it does play a part in this. That the standoff grew extremely volatile, and you know there, there's images that are all over the internet. You can see of oath keepers and and other militia members in sniper positions. You know with their sights on um, bureau land management and, and police officials. Again, Kyle Rittenhouse. It, it just something goes sideways, people die. You know, and fearing. A, I, I think a bloodbath kind of, you know, reminiscent of what happened at, at Ruby Ridge, Ridge or another one, you know, Waco as well. Waco. Yes. Yeah, well, exactly what I was thinking. About, yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and again, just making those connections. I, I don't, I, I don't think it's just correlated, you know, but the federal authorities ultimately backed it. They backed down and, and they released the cattle and, you know, there's, there's, there's pros to that and there's cons to that. You know, it might've been a good decision, as it was later revealed that um, supporters from, from the Bundy's ranks uh, had set up a quote here. That they, were stan- they were actually strategizing to put women in the front of their protests so that if there was a shooting, that the news coverage would show women being shot as opposed to men. So they were at that level of discussion, right? And Rhodes, for, for his part, and the Oath Keepers hailed it as a significant watershed moment. And it definitely validated and I think emboldened Rhodes and the Oath Keepers. Um, They released a video, the Oath Keepers did, um, calling it the first time in our country's recent history that good Americans stood up and said, we're not going to let this happen on our watch. Later, Rhodes would say on the Alex Jones show, um, quote, just as Americans across the country stormed the Bundy Ranch to stand up for a rancher's family, we need to go to Washington with the same conviction. And so, again, foreshadowing. This was years before January 6th, right? And, you know, you, 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 you can see maybe, I think with, with the empowerment that Rhodes felt and the validation of this, I think you can see him maybe becoming emboldened as stated, but also going further and further down this this rabbit hole of conspiracies and you know delusions <laughs> possibly believing that that he can actually do these things that he's talking about like storm washington you know yeah so at the same time that his ideology is becoming more extreme and his conspiracy theories are becoming more entrenched he's also feeling emboldened so i suppose this is all leading up to the culmination on january 6th yeah 
it, it's happening. You know, it's it, it's really happening. And you know, there are some other events too, because I think that the next big one, I, I think, is what we're going to see in in Oregon, and potentially where things go off the rails. But in in between. So, so in between those big things we talked about, and, and I guess maybe the next big thing, there were some other things too that that may be validated. So, following up on the actions against the Bureau of Land Management, um, Oath Keepers went on to aid Richard Barclay and George Bax. I might be pronouncing that last name wrong, B-A-C-K-E-S. But these were two individuals who were cited for unauthorized mining in Sugar Pine Mine in Oregon. So... Again, people kind of doing what they shouldn't be doing, and then the government getting involved, and um, you know it becoming a, a protest. So roughly 700 people showed up at this protest, kind of on the back of what happened at Bundy Ranch, um, including Oath Keepers and Three Percenters, kind of at the forefront of it. So what you would expect, you know, patrolling the area, being armed. There was a standoff that that ended again with the Bureau of Land Management deciding that these two individuals would be permitted to resume mining while an associated court case was still ongoing. And um, it wasn't something that lasted as long. It wasn't something that was as volatile as what happened at Bundy's Ranch. But again, it's, you know, it, it's everything that we just said, right? It's another notch. It's, you know, these, these conspiracies are becoming real and, and he's, you know, becoming validated by them. He's winning in, in his mind. In 2015, so now we're, we're moving up cr- you know, chronologically, there is also the, the shooting of Marines and sailors in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, Oath Keepers uh, volunteered themselves for action. <laughs> Again, this is kind of their thing. You know, no one asked them to show up, but they did anyway. Um, this time, they organized armed patrols at military recruiting centers. Uh, for, for their part, the, the U.S. Army Recruiting Command sent a letter to recruiters warning them to consider the armed civilians outside the recruiting centers as a, as a security threat. So, you know, maybe not a, a, a big incident, but again, just emboldened, you know, taking upon themselves to, to do something. But also, I think if the U.S. Army Recruiting Command is sending out letters, I would have to think that at this point, other people within the U.S. government is beginning to view these people as a legitimate security threat, as not just, you know, however you want to pose them, just people protesting in, in costume, say. But I think that the culminating thing that, 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 you know, really might have led to January 6th is this, this, the, the events that, that happened um, in Oregon at this wildlife at refuge. And the, the background in, involved Dwight Hammond Jr. and Steve Hammond. They were being arrested and sentenced to five years in prison for arson. They had set fire um, to federal land where, the ham, where they had been grazing uh, their cattle and um, their, their lease had also you know, been put into uh, dispute. So 100 acres of, of public land were destroyed by them. Um, FYI, too, um, these individuals were granted clemency by Donald Trump when he was president. So that kind of <laughs> ties that as well. The, the Bundy family of Nevada joined with the Oath Keepers and other militias to, of course, illegally um, take over and occupy the headquarters of the Mahler National Wildlife Refuge near the city of Burns, Oregon. And this became something of a combination of like a, a, a sit-in, occupation. Um, but essentially, this was a government building, you know, going back to 2010, when the very early Oath Keeper kind of attempted something similar with the, a town hall. But I think that this is escalation, you know, in, in which these people feel emboldened not just the protests, maybe actions on what they consider their land, but now actually going into, you know, government's territory, government buildings, and just yeah. taking them, right? And, and I think, you know, there, there's the brazenness of it, but I think that there's also this more nihilistic, you know, or, or maybe what you could call escalation of saying, what are you going to do? 
you know, Mm -hmm. Um, because so far you haven't done anything, right? And (laughs) yeah, I mean, January 6th. But speaking of the incident, Rhodes said, these are his quotes, uh, this is not an emergency situation unless you, speaking towards law enforcement, turn it into one. These ranchers, cowboys, and veterans armed as Westerners tend to be. Get over it. There are no hostages. There are no close-by neighbors at risk. There is nobody there except those who want to be. And yeah, you know, that's, to, I, I see that, that the escalation points, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, and I'm sure that he understands the history and I'm sure that he understands the interaction and the, the political damage, right or wrong, and, you know, I would, that's for a different episode. <laughs> I would very much argue wrong. But, but the, the, I guess, truthisms that, that have seeped into American culture regarding what happened at Waco, per se, or Ruby Ridge, as being used as propaganda against any kind of movement by law enforcement or federal agents in these situations. Sounds like a very um, dangerous combination of propaganda and brinksmanship, like he's almost daring the government to to make the same mistake again, uh, because actually Waco and Ruby Ridge were, were pretty damaging for the, for the Clinton administration, the government at the time. Yes, yes. It it was politically damaging in in terms of you know just you know political speak, but also uh, and and equally, if not more important, it, it it was something that could be used as propaganda and and a radicalization tool, you know, to get people who might not be going to gun shows and hanging out with you know Bo Grites who's talking about burning the UN flag and reciting revelations. It's something to bring, you know those people into a more radicalized position right yeah um yeah. And, and and also it's great propaganda against uh anything that's that's you know left of center too but yeah, it plays into a lot of fears that uh, a lot of people have uh ideas about you know the federal government coming to take their guns and their ideas and their freedom of religion etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh yeah it's 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 relentlessly used as exploited as propaganda of course of course and it's a, it's a topic that I'm passionate about, but with with all of the um, maybe accepting all of the nuance and and all of the things that the government could have done better or differently, I, I, I do think at the end of the day, you know, decisions made by these people, whether they were clear decisions or they were down, you know, rabbit holes of cult thought or radicalization based in these same conspiracies that are found in like the Oath Keeper Pledge, that they cr- helped create, they manifested what it is that they feared happening. And yeah. they made themselves martyrs in a way, you know? Yeah. It, it, it didn't need to go down like that, even with all of the mistakes, you know, on, on the, the government side. But we'll see here, the same thing happened, essentially. And, and, and you know, it's a great, I'm glad we had that, that side quest, because when we're looking at, at this iteration or this event in Oregon, where now they're escalating, occupying a, a government building, um, his daughter, Dakota, in that, that same, you know, going back to that, that excellent article from Southern Poverty Law Center, said that, that Rhodes hated, hated this event, essentially. He, he hated the thing because it was all about Ammon Bundy trying to be the Messiah and trying to fix everything that was wrong in his life by starting a civil war in her words and in her words it's hilarious because that is basically what Stuart ended up and that's Rhodes ended up doing by January 6th everything was falling apart for him he was afraid of going to prison so he just decided to double down and I mean that's insight from his daughter you know and um, that's why earlier I said there, there you know could be a separate article or, or project viewing this as just like the deconstruction of a, of a man, you know, through these conspiracy yeah. theories and through escalation, um, leading to maybe a self-fulfilling prophecy as well, you know, but with this, you know, we'll, we'll get there, but, um, <laughs> um, Ammon Bundy along with Rhodes and, and other oath keepers had dictated to the media and law enforcement's, what was going to happen, essentially? Um, you know, they kept saying that um, they had the support of locals, even though that's highly questionable. 
Um, they were <laughs> they were given multiple outs again. They were given multiple opportunities to just leave, and they didn't. Um, one such deal fell through with the occupiers claiming that the FBI had no standing. And so this was their excuse to continue this occupation. So they said that um, the FBI agents would need to be deputized to uh, negotiate mm-hmm. going back to this constitutional sheriff idea that has been a part of the Oath Keepers since their inception, too. It's uh, a very problematic idea that has, you know, that, that there could be an episode on constitutional sheriff, but um, yeah, it, 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 it can be rooted in, in some pretty racist stuff as well. But that was their excuse of saying, you know, no, you're FBI, you don't have jurisdiction, essentially. And on January 26th, now we're in 2016, again, it's like every year, it's, it's moving up, escalating. The occupation leaders were traveling. They're going to participate in a meeting set up by local residents. Um, the highway that they were traveling on had been shut down due to the standoff. And once the car was spotted by law enforcement, the group was forced to pull over. And um, in that in that uh, event, there was a melee that uh, had occurred. There was uh, an individual named uh, Robert Finnicum. He exited his truck, making motions to his jacket while yelling for police to shoot him, which they did. Um, officers later uh, found a loaded weapon in his pocket. So that individual died from his wounds. And Ryan Bundy, 43, sustained a minor gunshot wound. Um, but it was, again, Robert uh, Lavoie, sometimes his middle name is included, Finnicum was killed. Um Others that were in the car were, were charged with felony conspiracy to impede federal officers. So, you know, it, it just it goes back to what we were discussing about this idea of, of escalation. And now people are dying. Right. It, it really is like they're getting what they want, isn't it? It is, isn't it? And just like, um, you know, we kind of discussed earlier about historical uh, historical figures you know manifesting what it is that that they want you know potentially to be martyrs it it, it does seem to be almost like an apocalyptic suicide mission in a way you know there's so many different different things as we saw Uh, in 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 the pledge in that oath you know just borrowing from so many things from you know these these fringe right-wing you know maybe christian sect ideas uh to more you know, racist, anti-Semitic, globalist things. It's just all there. And it's kind of people living it out like an action adventure. Yeah, uh, the the whole um, sovereign citizen, constitutional sheriff, posse comitatus stew. Of course. Yeah, that's Ron Paul, you know, go back to that. That's (laughs) informing who, you know, Rhodes became as, as an adult and as a leader of this group, you know. But um, this was 20... 15 2016 or so and this is actually where events kind of died down a little bit for them which was you know at at first just doing research i found interesting you know i was saying to myself well what happened um i did find something on stanford's center for international security and cooperation um who have um, a timeline as well uh, of some high level events um, they don't go into ideology and stuff like that, but but high level events, and um, they designated this era between 2017 and 2020 as um an, as an ideological pivot for the group is how they put it, and the ideological pivot was necessary because there is a new president, right? So newly elected President Trump <laughs> yeah. came into office, and he promised to fight back against the deep state and so in some ways oath keepers now found themselves aligning with the federal government in a way or at least donald trump and yeah. this left them kind of anchorless they were seeking a new enemy and you know up to this point the the land manage- management and the standoffs with feds had, had really been their success story maybe more so than ferguson even but yeah now what so Stuart Rhodes posted a call to action on the Oath Keepers website titled Operation Sabot 2016. And what was it to do? Well, in quotes, help police ensure the free and fair election process is not stolen from the citizens 
of the United States of America. So this is 2016. Um, dog whistles, uh, at least in my mind, such as watching out for, quote unquote, busloads of voters being shipped in uh, were used. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, things like that were used to justify these kind of conspiracies around the idea that there could be election fraud in 2016 that could, you know, subvert a Trump presidency. Um, and of course, the bus of voters, that's just, you know, the old racist trope, but... Yeah, Roy Moore used that story about uh, uh, people being bussed in over state lines as well. Of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's the same, you know, it's, it's, it's that nuance. It, it's that, you know, it's, <laughs> I mean, not in this case, but it's a thing that allows you to, to say, be monetized on social media. Right? <laughs> you, you say, you say globalists, you don't say a Jewish person, you know, you, you say busloads yeah. of, of voters being shipped in, you don't say African Americans or what have you, you know. But I think even though there were events and they were more low level, maybe than than what had been occurring, you know, people were getting shot in the side of the road. Um, I think that they're key to to the culmination, the crescendo of January sixth, because the way in which Oath Keepers kind of pivoted to uh, remain relevant was they, they had to find you know enemies, and around and after the election of Trump, you had Antifa and other anti-fascist groups that were yeah. targeting Trump and Trump supporters, right? And so in reaction, yeah, the patriots and militia movement extremists all started to rally around Antifa and sometimes Black Lives Matter as that, that common enemy. Yeah. And if that doesn't just play into, I mean, you know, that, that, that's the stuff that mentioning earlier, you know, Eric Rudolph was talking about in the 90s. I mean, this is just, you know, these, these, these far left, you know, bad actors, the conspiracies go everywhere, you know, being funded by Soros and, mm -hmm. you know, Hillary and stuff. But it's just old communists, right? It's just that communist red scare thing. John Birch rephrased for today. Yeah, it just, you know, it, it goes back into the same fears that people of someone of Rhodes's generation, you know, if, if you're into this and, and you got you know, radicalized. It's, it's, it's the core principles of that. And again, it's as if you see them being realized, you know, and, and now you're a key player in it. So along with the, the rise of fascist and far right racist groups protesting and becoming more visible, there was also this debate that was kind of angling or, or trying to play off of free speech. And, and that's kind of where the Oath Keepers got a foothold next. And um, they were present at Berkeley, California protests. So uh, I'm sure people, listeners of this show are probably aware of this, but the protests were against alt-right speakers, you know. So um, e e Milo, for instance, and, and a number of mm -hmm. other people were invited to the University of California, Berkeley, under the guise of freedom of speech, right? And, you know, free, free speech was is also one of the things that's highlighted in the Oath Keepers pledge or, or what have you. So it's a core principle. Um, at the event, 21 people were arrested, including some on the suspicion of assault with a deadly weapon. Uh, according to Officer Brian White of the Berkeley Police Department, there were, uh, and I remember when this occurred, but the, there were 11 people who were injured, at least six taken to a hospital for treatment, including a stabbing victim. I remember the stabbing victim specifically. Um, in 2018, moving along again, getting closer, you know, to that pivotal event, Rhodes stated on, on InfoWars that Oath Keepers would start the Spartan Training Groups program to combat Antifa and serve as a national militia that could be called upon by President Trump if needed. So here yeah. we see that the, yes, the plot or the narrative coming, you know, this mm -hmm. is before, this is a little before or maybe at the same times where, where Rhodes is also floating the use of the Insurrection Act as well. So um, it, was during, it was during this time that Proud Boys and Patriot Prayer were taking front stage as well in clashes along the, the West Coast from San Francisco to Olympia to Portland, Oregon. Yeah, you know, Oath Keepers found a, a, a use for themselves in, in these as well. But by this point, Oath Keepers had done a 180 from their originally stated purpose. You know, they were actively 
working to protect the Trump administration. And it was around this time, too, I think that, you know, QAnon was, was really taking off. And there was certainly a lot of crossover in the broad range of Q or Q adjacent conspiracies and, and the things that we talked about earlier. Um, and this created a narrative in which, you know, one could also position themselves as being contrarian for supporting Trump. I, I think that that's the way that the Oath Keepers justified, you know, what it is that they were doing, that, that they were still part of this, you know, revolution against the deep state, even though they're supporting a, a sitting president. Yeah. But when COVID happened, everything just went on steroids, as, as I'm sure that, that you know. So uh, the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism found that Oath Keepers had shown a willingness and even enthusiasm to spread misinformation and conspiracy theories related to the virus and, and the disease of so COVID. Um, a CTEC investigation of Oath Keeper-related social media accounts shows important figures, including Rhodes, proliferating, uh, among other dangerous rhetoric, QAnon-related language, false uh, home remedies for COVID-19 and conspiracy theories about Bill Gates, Anthony Fauci, etc. And, and again, it goes right back. You know, we, we mentioned at the start of the show, the Ron Paul newsletters. There's loads of stuff in there about how AIDS is a, is a conspiracy and so on and so forth. Swine flu. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's again, I, I, I think it's just... The, the utility in, in understanding that is also the understanding that this is going to happen again, you know, and yeah. that this stuff is just, it's cyclical. It's repackaged. It looks a little bit different. And for whatever reason, at least in the United States, when these things remanifest, they're never taken seriously, you know, for whatever, or, or if they are, they're lone wolves. There, there's never a coherent ideology behind this. That's been informing generations of, of people to commit acts of terrorism or violence. And the mainstream is always uh, ignore, ignore, uh, or downplay, downplay, laugh, laugh, laugh. And then when it explodes, the reaction is always, go, well, where did this come from? What's happening? When <laughs> yes, yes. And, and conversely, you know, it's the opposite with the left, isn't it? You know, everything with the left are these, you know, if you support the, the slightest thing left of center, you're, you're all of a sudden part of something that you know might allude back to the 1960s <laughs> and there's this there's clear you know ideology of the left which is you know dated back forever but but not of, of the right for whatever reason but you know going back to those as we were just discussing i, I have in my notes here going back to the initial oath keeper orders regarding detention camps foreign soldiers on u.s soil all the surrounding context of, of anti-Semitism and New World Order conspiracies, the Turner Diaries. Yeah, you know, all of this stuff was QAnon. And, and, and if the Oath Keepers pledge was, you know, an aggregation of these things, QAnon was just all this stuff on, on steroids. <laughs> and, and the Oath Keepers took advantage of it, you know, for sure. And, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's a way in which it, it, it was a tool and a wave that they could use, uh, and of course, with social media, you know, all the marketing involved with that and, and keywords and SEO. And it was a way that they could get their message out to people who normally wouldn't be interested in, in hearing their message. So, you know, they gained, they gained some credibility with, you know, people in the suburbs, for instance. Um, yeah. and, and I can't tell you how many times, unfortunately, I've seen that with people in pickup trucks and, you know, an Oath Keepers bumper sticker, 3% bumper sticker that, you know, would, would otherwise have, have never have known if maybe COVID hadn't have happened and people weren't glued to social media. But, but yeah, you know, that, that, that was a, a big messaging point for them. And, and, and again, a way to validate them to an audience that normally, you know, wouldn't have been exposed to them in, in that way. Um, also, I think, too, you know, in, in this moment of validation, this is kind of when, when Roger Stone enters the picture as well. And Roger Stone was an advisor to then President Trump, and he began using Oath Keepers as personal security for himself. And it was also, you know, kind of pre, but around the time of, you know, that big lie beginning to be un unrolled, you know, and, and people for and, and people sometimes forget, I think, that the idea of the election being stolen was an idea that had been planted well before the actual election, going as far back as to removing like 
you know, sorting machines and post offices, for instance. And well, and as we saw in 2016, with the Oath Keepers, you know, participating in, in what they considered anti-fraud activities for Trump. And Trump himself, of course, laying the groundwork for disputing the result if he lost in 2020. And even right back at the start of the, the, the first Trump election, 2016, saying, uh, well, I would have uh, won the popular vote, too, if there hadn't been so much voter fraud, so many dead people voting, etc. He's, uh, he's, always, he's always been doing this. Yeah, yeah. And, but in, in this time, Trump began pushing conspiracies kind of geared towards, I suppose, the 2020 election. And it, the, as you had mentioned earlier, the you know, mail-in ballots were a primary source of, of these conspiracies. But um, Rhodes himself bought in, you know, a hundred percent, and and so the Oath Keepers, as the organization, did as well. According to Rhodes, his quotes: "It's just amazing that Trump let the election be stolen right out from under him, and to let our country be stolen like this." So. You know, it, it, it is a, a theme that, that existed the whole time, but you know, it, it's it's something that, I mean, it seems as if Rhodes, you know, truly believed in it, at, at least. Um, and it, it obviously informed, you know, what was going to come. Y- you had mentioned that great quote much earlier, but I, I had pulled something that was, it was just a, a retweet, but it was something when Trump still had his Twitter in, in September of 2020, he retweeted, um, if the Democrats are successful in removing the president from office, which they will never be, it will cause a civil war like fracture in this nation from which our country will never heal. And it was from Pastor Robert Jeffress uh, at Fox mm-hmm. News. And just in my mind, and, and of course, so, so the president retweeted this, you know, and I was thinking courtside Mayor Ed Foster talking about election fraud back in the very beginning, you know. Tea Party rhetoric surrounding Obama, um, what, what you had mentioned, you know, going back to 2015 and 16 with Oath Keepers talking about fraud. It, again, it, 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 if anything, you know, Rhodes had said it was amazing that Trump allowed you know, the country to be stolen like this. And I also think it's just amazing that collectively we, we just allowed all this to, to happen. You know, it. When, when, when I've listened in, in research, focusing on January 6th specifically, a lot of the rhetoric is around shock and surprise that maybe local officials didn't take more action looking at the chatter, you know, in the months leading up to January 6th. And, and that's true. And that's valid as well. But, you know, I, I also think maybe if you pull out from that and look at a macro view, th- I mean, this has been laid out for many, many years. And it's just, again, it's amazing that... It, oh, it, it almost happened, you know, it almost happened. So um, moving forward, let's see, I had some some more things, but I, I think at this point we could jump to January 6th. And the descriptions that, that I have um, are descriptions of what happened um, taken from the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, United States of America, V. And then a series of individuals, but including Elmer Sort Road. So this is the verbiage lifted directly from the, the, the court filing of this. And there was chatter, as you mentioned, leading up to the events, a lot of it. Um, it's somewhat difficult, you know, to, to look back now, as I had mentioned in the very beginning, a lot of things associated with the Oath Keepers have been wiped out or, or scrubbed, etc. But there's still so much here and it's just so damning. Um, I guess start with the counts, you know, seditious conspiracy. That's the big one. Conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, obstruction of an official proceeding and aiding and abetting conspiracy to prevent an officer from discharging any duties, destruction of government property and aiding and abetting civil disorder and aiding and abetting tampering with documents or proceedings and aiding and abetting. And if you kind of work your way backwards, you know, some of these are things that they had done in the past and gotten away with. Um, Not sedition, but, um, you know, these ideas of of feeling emboldened to, I don't know, obstruct an official proceeding, for instance, um, Mm -hmm. or the idea to prevent an officer from from discharging, you know, any duties. And, you know, in, in various ways, they or people that they had been associated with had done this in the past and been successful. 
Um, the introduction of this court document states that after Trump's loss, Elmer Stort Rhodes conspired with his co-defendants to oppose by force the lawful transition of presidential power. So, you know, that's the verbiage from the court documents. And I would just, again, I've seen already too much of people attempting to either downplay, um, make, make, you know, Rose look like a, a clown show or say that this was an extreme minority. And that's not what the court is saying, <laughs> at least not in this document. Evidence includes coordinating travel to the events, bringing weapons to the events, building a cache of weapons on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. to be distributed among quick reaction force teams. Yep. Um, movements were all organized and coordinated. So they had a plan. And, you know, as we'll see, they, 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 they partially executed their plan. Uh, beginning in November 2020, Rhodes be, uh, was disseminating messages on an encrypted application to encourage co-conspirators to oppose by force the lawful transfer of power of uh, presidential power. So that's what everybody's been saying, right? That this was an attempt to disrupt or, or you know, stop the, the peaceful transition of power, the cornerstone of, of democracy. And, um, you know, that's when everybody on, on the other side argues, no, these people were just protesting and, you know, they had the right to be there and Trump did not direct them. Well, again, no, this is not what this is stating here. So, yeah, they were attempting to oppose by force the lawful transition of power. Mm -hmm. Two days after the election, Rhodes sent a message stating, we aren't getting through this without a civil war. So his words, right? We're having a civil war, basically. Uh, he went on to say, we must, we must now do what the people of Serbia did, which was interesting, when Milosevic stole their election. He sent a video entitled, he being Rhodes, sent a video to this group entitled Step-by-Step -Step Procedure, How We Won When Milosevic Stole Our Election, which provided a detailed description of the upheaval, including the storming of their parliaments and how they did that. So... This is the source material, right? This is how we're going to do it. Rhodes held a go-to meeting to outline plans to stop the lawful transfer of power, including preparations for the use of force. From there, the co-conspirators sent out messages to recruits about military-style basic training. Other messages contained information on recon uh, yeah, reconnaissance in the D.C. area and various trainings on unconventional warfare being offered. In messages, uh, Rhodes stated, it will be a bloody fight. We are going to have to fight. That can't be avoided. And, you know, there's more, but the, 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 the certitude of, I mean, to me, this is apocalyptic, you know, and, and, and it's going back to what we were talking about of that self-fulfilling prophecy of, of whatever it is, you know, whether it's some weird Christian identity movement, you know, martyr and possibly how that impacted people like the weavers or, or waco and but but up mm -hmm. to this where you have the leader telling you <laughs> what's going to happen you know and yeah. it's almost and his daughters going back to what his daughters had stated you know he, he felt like he was going to go to jail and he he was going all in on this i mean it felt like a suicide mission you know hey, it's like the phenomenon that uh, they talk about in cults forcing the end like uh, jonestown for instance it is. And, you know, I know that you have to be careful when when making comparison, but but I think at least there there might be analogies that could be made for sure that, that are valid, you know. So <laughs> I'll say last time I on a side note, last time that happened, it, it resulted in the Caleb Malpin. <laughs> and so who knows? But <laughs> yeah. Uh <laughs> but the the evidence is I mean, it's just damning, you know, it's, it's, it, it's saying what people are saying um, and it's countering what, what others who are trying to delude it are, are saying, but getting to the nitty gritty of it. So around 2 PM, um, a larger group forced entry into the Capitol and Rhodes was among them. So he was among the first group to, to get in other people, Kelly Meigs, Kenneth um, Harrelson, Jessica Watkins, Joseph Hackett. Um, people that, that were with him in this operation um, followed him. And the way that they referred to this was this was stack formation one. 
So this was an, an organized effort. There was strategy behind it. Um, they had the name. So st Stack One was the first formation to breach security and enter the Capitol. After a melee with police officers, Stack One forced their entrance into the rotunda doors. Once inside, Stack One then divided, and this was all practice beforehand. One group attempting to break law enforcement blockage of a hallway leading to the Senate chamber. And the other half headed to the House of Representatives searching for specifically Speaker Pelosi. Later, again, you know, highly organized, a second group called Stack Two um, made their way up, composed of co defendants. They breached the Capitol and entered into a melee with law enforcement who used chemical spray to try to deter them. Jeremy Brown, an Oath Keeper member from Florida, um, drove explos explosives to a Virginia hotel in his recreational vehicle on January 6th. A second member of the group, Thomas Caldwell, was later found in possession of a death list that included the names uh, of Georgia election officials, according to the documents. So, you know, recall that what happened with Trump and, and his attempt to kind of strong arm Georgia election officials to essentially just flip it for him so that he could get the electoral vote from that state. Um, Rhodes was unwilling to sit for a taped um, disposition during the January 6th committee investigation, but he was interviewed by the committee. He largely invoked his Fifth Amendment rights. Um, in exchange, Rhodes demanded uh, that, that he would speak freely if he would be given live airtime to do so. And, you know, this was just never going to happen. Um, yeah. I think we all know what, what, you know, what have occurred with that. So, um, you know, it, it was a way of him stalling, but it's also a way of him kind of justifying pleading the fifth over and over again, saying, well, we could meet in the middle and we could do this live. You know, I don't trust you to represent my words in, in a good faith manner, which, you know, it's maybe he really believes that, but it sounds kind of like a way to get around answering questions, too. Um, so far, three members of the Oath Keepers have pled guilty to seditious conspiracy, being William Todd Williamson, Brian Ulrich, and Joshua James. Um, in his guilty plea, Wilson, a military and law enforcement veteran, admitted that he agreed with others to take part in a plan to use force to prevent, hinder, and delay the execution of the laws of the United States governing the transfer of presidential power. He and others use encrypted and private communications, equip themselves with a variety of weapons, donned combat and tactical gear, and were prepared to answer a call to take up arms. Um, others, including Rhodes, have obviously pled not guilty to this point. So with, with this research, I suppose, um, kind of wrapped up two weeks ago, um, I, I've I've been away on travel last week, but since then, some things have occurred too. The United States District Court uh, for Columbia, in in this court case of the nine defendants, including Rhodes, um, is on track to begin this month after a federal judge turned down a request by nearly all the defendants to put off the court showdown until next year, September 26, being the date for uh, opening jury selection. There's a lot that you could debrief on with this, but, you know, we'll see what happens with the organization, you know, with these individuals, of course. But for me, you know, personally, kind of delving into this a bit, and there's so much more, of course, but those themes that we talked about in the beginning, you know, and just the idea of hammering home how even if these people were maybe individually buffoonish in, in their own right, but how close they came to doing something, whatever that might be, and how dangerous and equipped they truly were. And I guess also how they were not, you know, a part of something that formed in Ferguson or that got uh, uh, catapulted by QAnon, but how, I mean, talking about the elders of Zion, you know, how these beliefs are repackaged and sold you know, for decades, at least in U.S. history, you know, that direct connection to the, the 1990s. And, and I, I, I just can't help but, but see that connection and, and the validity that 
those fringe ideas have gained to the point now of, you know, Rhodes going to jail potentially, but that if he is in jail, people in the Republican Party still campaigning and using imagery and slogans steeped in these conspiracies that are essentially now accepted as mainstream. And what is that going to be moving forward? You know, it's that, that's a different episode, I suppose. But yeah, a, a lot to chew on. So that's that's where that's where I'm at with with the Oath Keepers. And there's mm-hmm. just so much more. So maybe to start wrapping up, um, what, what would you say were your main takeaways from this? How, how would you how would you synthesize it down? I mean, if I, you know, there, there's obviously many, but I, I think if you really had to distill it down, I think it, it just really is how dangerous conspiracy theories are, you know, how, how, how dangerous specifically to American culture, uh, specifically in our time that right wing conspiracies are, and that, you know, there's a lot that we could talk about with, with right wing extremism, but that at the end of the day, just how ruinous this is. To, to people's lives and, and, and people who are just uninvolved or, or that are involved uh, not due to their free will, um, such as, you know, Rhodes's children and, yeah. and, and the insight that they had or victims of, of, of people who commit violence, you know, mm-hmm. in the 90s since. But because and, and, and there, there will be something, there's always something, you know, and, and it's big money. And so I suppose to me, for people listening and, and looking forward for themselves and their mental health, but, but also their family too, and, and people that they know and care about. Whatever the next thing is, maybe it's the next incarnation of a disease or something that Joe Biden does, some policy, you know, but, but there will be something and all these themes are going to be repackaged. And there's power in, in knowing where they come from and how they've been used because you can't debate them. You know, and, and conspiracies are, are inherently... <laughs> they're not logical, you know, and they're, they're made to not be debated, but there's power in, in understanding what they are, where they come from and how they're used. And to be able to present that to somebody to say, you're being conned and here's why. And I think that maybe not initially, but in, in, in the long term, that might get through to some people. One of the things that scholars of fascism talk about a lot is its syncretic properties its ability to well it's a scavenger ideology that that famous phrase um and its ability to hoover up all, all the all the bits and pieces that it needs um and i i think we see that very clearly with QAnon, which has been called a a, a, um, a meta conspiracy you know it's kind of an umbrella conspiracy it can contain all the other ones inside it um you just use the word repackage, and it, it, it seems to me that that's at least as important a part of how this works, the ability not, not to you know, add new stuff, um, but to repackage the old stuff, to rebrand it and, and retransmit it in a way that makes sense in the modern context. And I think maybe in a more dire level, <laughs> potentially, but, but connected to everything that you just said and, and everything I said earlier is that you know, I, I, I highlighted maybe a new disease or, or a policy of Joe Biden, but this, that, everything that we've talked about is, is now mainstream for the Republican Party, you know, and, and, and speaking yeah. on the United States, I, I, I'm aware of, of UK politics too, but there's, it, it's going to be hugely important the next, you know, six years, eight years to see what happens with this. You know, the, the Oath Keepers are a part of it, and Trump is a part of it, but, you know, this has been something that's existed for a long time, and now it's been validated and institutionalized in a way. Again, going back to those prison letters from Eric Rudolph saying, I had to blow up these, these women's clinics and, and the Olympics because I had no representation. Well, I mean, I, now he does. You know, he does have representation. Yeah. And what the heck does that mean? <laughs> and and is it a passing thing or is it a thing that's going to stay with us? Because, you know, more so or, or in a different way, not more so, but in a different way, while all these conspiracies and things being repackaged can impact people that you care about, um, you know, it's also going to manifest in, well, we've already seen it, but in politics. And that means legislation and laws. 
and that's a scary thing yeah and it really is true now that the united states has us two as one of its two main parties um a fascist party or perhaps if we go with president biden a uh, a semi-fascist party what it looks like to me is um, the, the the classic pattern of the fascist takeover of the capitalist state is that in a in a period of crisis, uh, fascist the fascist movement strong arms itself into a position where it's a major player, um, and the mainstream right uh, conservative r- rulership of of the state, um, parliamentary state, kind of adopts fascism or takes it on board because it feels that it needs to both to kind of neutralize it uh, and contain it and maybe to use it uh, against their enemies um, thinking they can control it little do they know but um, that that process doesn't seem to have worked so far anyway in terms of the American state as a whole but it's almost like a cameo version of that process has has taken place inside the Republican Party so you now have the Republican Party is like a uh, just in in this sense anyway like a mini state that's been captured by a fascist movement um, and uh, so you, you now have effectively a MAGA party and uh, I'm not doing that thing that the centrist pundits do, you know, where they say, oh, if you know, yearning for the old good Republican Party where it was full of sensible good uh, uh, men like Ronald Reagan, you know, <laughs> not doing that. But uh, yeah, there is a qualitative difference, I think. And uh, so, yeah, America now has a kind of uh, a fascist or, or fascist captured party vying for state power. And yeah, you know, what's it, it's 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 going what's going to happen next? And you know, liberal pundits aside, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. But I mean, you know, Liz Cheney was a victim of this and right or wrong, you know, it's going to be interesting to see if that is something that takes hold. And these whether whether they're Trump people or maybe in the future DeSantis people or whomever, whomever's next to kind of take this up um, to see internally how the Republican Party goes. But I see the Tea Party as being just so fundamental to this process because they were the ones, they started Rhino, they started Republicans in name only. They were the ones that said get incumbents out. And they were the ones that validated all of the conspiracy. They were the ones that invited people like the Oath Keepers in, you know? And and it's just that that transitional piece from people like Timothy McVeigh or Eric that, that did these things on their own or in militias, the Montana Freeman and things like that in the nineties to gaining institutional power and political representation. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, again, it's been a long, pro- it, it's almost like the overturning of Roe v. Wade. It's been a long process of steps that in hindsight seem very clear and maybe culminating in an event like January 6th in which people never thought would happen or, for that instance, the overturning of Roe v. Wade, you know, but we're going to need to watch how the Republican Party handles this because, <laughs> as you know, it's, you know, fascists don't always play by the rules. And everything up to this point has been geared towards, you know, what they're doing with, with general elections against Democrats. But, you know, this could be turned inward as well. Trump and Trumpism may be, it seems, may be starting to be on the decline. Maybe, maybe that's optimistic, but uh, the process continues, though. And it does seem like the Republican Party is pretty committed to uh, attempting to, not to sound melodramatic about it, but attempting to steal elections. I mean, it, it's pretty clear that through redistricting and uh, voter suppression and controlled electors and things like that, they are planning everything they can to take elections take election wins that they they don't actually get and uh meanwhile of course we have on the ground these potential shock troops which is another essential part of the uh the the, the fascist pattern and i don't know if and when it comes the shock troops might not be specifically the oath keepers but it'll be something like them something that's grown out of them more parallel to them um so we we have a, we have a, a situation where you you have a uh, a fascist captured party which is apparently intent upon as I say, a taking election wins it, it's not entitled to, with a, a whole potential host of uh, shock troops on the ground um, to use to enforce their will, as indeed they tried to do on January 6th. That's pretty much exactly what they tried to do on January the 6th. I mean, it's, it's in, in a way, it's a certainty, but I think the question is, what, in what way does it manifest and, and what power does it have? You know, I mean, there, there's... <laughs> With, with with these conspiracies and these concepts, while we can talk about you know elders of Zion, for instance, and these things that date back ages, but there there there's a discussion that needs to be had about 
the inherent conspiracies involved in modern American culture and, and how Americans perceive themselves in the United States right. and their identity and the role of the United States in the world. And, you know, th- that ha- that's a reckoning that that's been unfolding for a while, but it's, it's something that I, I, I believe is just inherent that it's always going to be there on some level. It's just whether or not it's a group of 10 people, you know, on the corner with a, a, a megaphone or whether it's, people entering government building okay well i think that'll do thank you so much rob for that incredibly detailed and interesting uh, breakdown of the oath keepers that's brilliant um so where can people find you if they want to track down your work which i strongly uh, advise them so to do yeah so uh on twitter at the right podcast and of course youtube is is where i mainly live that's where my videos live um, the same, you can look up the channel, uh, The Right Podcast, or linked out from uh, from my Twitter. Okay, well, thanks again, and uh, thanks for listening, everybody. I will be back soon with Daniel, hopefully. And, uh, yeah, tune in for that. Cheers, and bye. That was I Don't Speak German. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show or found it useful, please spread the word. If you want to contact me, I'm at underscore Jack underscore Graham underscore. Daniel is at Daniel E. Harper. And the show's Twitter is at IDSGPod. If you want to help us make the show and stay 100% editorially independent, we both have Patreons. I Don't Speak German is hosted at I Don't Speak German dot Libsyn.com. And we're also on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and we show up in all podcast apps. This show is associated with Eruditorum Press, where you can find more details about it. The music was by Loon the Band.